Hello, I'm Paul and I'm one of the tutors at St. Paul's Theological College. It is a privilege to share from God's Word with you at HDBB Online. Uh, before we continue, let us commit this time to the Lord in prayer. Let us pray. Gracious and loving Father, we thank you for your Word. For your Word is life. And even as we sit at your feet, therefore, listening to your Word being read and expounded from, we ask for your Holy Spirit to guide us into all truth to cause us to see not only the treasure of your word, but as one culminating in Jesus Christ, your Son. So speak to us, O God, we pray, for your children are listening. In Jesus' matchless name we pray. Amen. Now, today I will be sharing from Psalm 1, and allow me first to read that psalm to you. Psalm 1. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. He is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither. In all that he does, he prospers. The wicked are not so, but are like chaff that the wind drives away. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. This is the word of the Lord. I wonder for us today, as we reflect on what it means to be blessed, what does someone have to say for us? We hear the word blessing, I think, almost every time we come to church, isn't it? Uh, whether it be words like, may God bless you, or let us say the blessing, we give thanks for the food, may God bless our food even. Uh, but what does blessing mean, at least in the context of Psalm 1? Um, I would like to put it before you that as we read through Psalm 1 and we use the lens of the Old Testament, actually, how God's people, Israel, understood blessing, we would come to this realization that blessing is not only a gesture of goodwill, as pleasant as that is when we wish it to one another, but that blessing is within the context of a very special relationship between God and His people. It is what some people, some scholars call as creation blessing. And it's something that is enshrined in this special relationship that God had with Moses and with the Israelites as he rescued them from slavery and bring them into the promised land. Now, when we look at the first verse, therefore, blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers. And verse 2, it goes on to say, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. Blessedness is not just a feeling of contentment, of fulfillment, of even just happiness, but it is one that is actually entrenched in this dynamic of learning about God's law, about understanding His heart. Now, the law of the Lord, therefore, is not just this arbitrary list of do's and do nots. In the Old Testament, in Holy Scripture, we see that God communicates His heart. He pours out His will, His dreams, His hopes for the people of Israel, not only for themselves, but for all the nations in the ancient Near East back then, to prosper. And it is in this context that I would like to just put it before you in reflection on the first two verses that a man, a woman, a child is blessed when they delight in God's law. Now, where does this come from specifically? We find it in one of the most um, well-known passages in the book of Deuteronomy. And if you have your Bibles with you, you can turn it together with me as well. In Deuteronomy chapter 6. And let me read this passage to you. A little bit of a context, we find that Israel, the people of God, who were enslaved for so many years in Egypt, were miraculously and mightily delivered through the hand of Moses out of Egypt across the Sea of Reeds, now going towards the Promised Land. They had encountered uh, many, many years of the wilderness due to disobedience, and it was also a time of purification. But now, 
at the cusp of the Promised Land, in Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy 6, we find that the people of Israel are being reminded of their special position under the rule of God. And this is what God has to say to them through Moses. In Deuteronomy 6, it says, Now this is the commandment, the statutes and the rules that the Lord your God commanded me to teach you, that you may do them in the land to which you are going over to possess it, that you may fear the Lord your God, you and your son and your son's son, by keeping all his statutes and his commandments, which I command you all the days of your life, and that your days may be long. Hear therefore, O Israel, and be careful to do them, that it may go well with you, that you may multiply greatly as the Lord, the God of your fathers has promised you, in a land flowing with milk and honey. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house. And when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise, you shall bind them as a sign on your hand and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. Sometimes I guess when we read this passage, I can't help, well, at least in our Malaysian context, if you're living in Malaysia, it sounds almost as a, well, a precedent, isn't it? For Bible verses, for magnets, for bookmarks, for fridge magnets to be, to be something that is in line with this passage, that the word of the Lord needs to be permeating every aspect of life. It needs to be everywhere. It needs to be talked about. It needs to be applied. Uh, this sounds quite revolutionary, quite radical, isn't it? Some may be even saying, well, that sounds quite extreme. But when we realize that the law of the Lord, even as it's mentioned in Psalm 1, is something that is to be delighted in. And when we realize it is so because it is actually God, the creator of all known matter, the author and perfecter of our faith in Jesus Christ, this same God decides to communicate with us intelligibly with words that we can understand for our good so that we may prosper, so that we may see how great a God He is, how faithful He is, how He desires to show us the best way to live. And it is seen specifically such a grand and overwhelming perspective of who God is and what He wants for us. It is seen specifically through the lens of Scripture as He has caused it to be written through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And it is in light of this, let's not forget, isn't it? Psalm 1 takes place within this compendium of literature, of poetry, of songs to be sung to God in response to who He is, what He has done, what He is doing, what He continues to do for the benefit and blessing of His people and for the whole world. In light of that, does it not therefore make sense, joyous sense, that as we look at Psalm 1, it says, a man, a person is blessed when his delight is in the law of the Lord. And on his law, he meditates day and night. Now, increasingly, we know we are becoming a reading culture. It doesn't matter it is, whether it is in bite size or in longer uh, uh, articles. But my question for all of us today is, uh, how much time do we spend meditating on Scripture? In contrast with the... Uh, being inundated with so much of the media today, so much content we have in the world. Let me encourage all of us that as we realize that God's word, God's law, is the outpouring of His heart for us, that we may actually see this as the lens that we use to look at life, to plan for humanity's flourishing. Now, that's not all. When a person delights in the law of the Lord, he doesn't only come to know of God's beautiful plan for himself, for his family, for his nation, for the world. We find that this person is like a tree. If we look at verse 3, isn't it? He is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season and its leaf does not wither. In all that he does, he prospers. What does it mean to prosper? And I submit before you right now, actually, even as we reflect on Scripture, that Scripture has a lot to say about how prosperity... It's not on one end of the spectrum purely spiritual, neither is it just purely material. 
if we look again in Scripture, again going back to the book of Deuteronomy where the people of God are at the cusp of the promised land, where God tells them, this is my plan for you. This is what will happen when you as the people of God already chosen by God, already experiencing His salvation, already experiencing His mercies, when you as the people of God continue in that way, you will prosper. Well, how so? Let me give you some examples of how the people of God back then were to be given this life of prosperity on the condition that they continued to walk in the ways and the heart of God. If we go to the same book in Deuteronomy chapter 28, and let me read this to you. Again, the same background. People at the cusp of the promised land. And this is what the Lord says through Moses. And if you faithfully obey the voice of the Lord your God, Deuteronomy 28, being careful to do all his commandments that I command you today. The Lord your God will set you high above all the nations of the earth and all these blessings shall come upon you and overtake you if you obey the voice of the Lord your God. Blessed shall you be in the city and blessed shall you be in the field. Blessed shall be the fruit of your womb and the fruit of your ground and the fruit of your cattle, the increase of your herds and the young of your flock. Blessed shall be your basket and your kneading bowl. Blessed shall you be when you come in, and blessed shall you be when you go out. The Lord will cause your enemies who rise against you to be defeated before you. They shall come out against you one way and flee before you seven ways. The Lord will command the blessing on you in your barns and in all that you undertake, and he will bless you in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. The Lord will establish you as a people holy to himself as he has sworn to you, if you keep the commandments of the Lord your God and walk in his ways. And all the peoples of the earth shall see that you are called by the name of the Lord. Prosperity, as we see in Scripture, in Deuteronomy, and echoed now in Psalms 1, is obviously holistic. In Jewish thought, if you read scripture and if you understand the, the time of the day back in scripture, there was no dichotomy between secularism or spirituality. It's all one package. And when we understand this concept, this pronouncement of blessing, blessing and prosperity for God's people, it encompasses all spheres of life. But that's not all. It's not just for one's private enjoyment. It's not just about self-indulgence, but it's to show that the reign of God in accordance to His ways leads to complete life of flourishing. And it is to the extent that when the people of God, if Israel were obedient, if Israel did joyously commit to that way, they would have become that lighthouse for the ancient Near East that the nations around them in Canaan would have seen. They would have not only stood in awe, they would have not only stood terrified because they said, we have to follow this God, because not only will He bring our wickedness to judgment, to the light of day, but it would also be a form of attraction to realize that there is really indeed no other God but the Lord of Israel. Prosperity has this spillover effect in the life of Israel in his understanding of prosperity. And the imagery given to us today is also no less attractive because in verse 3 it says, this person is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season and its leaf does not wither. I don't know about you, but uh, I'm quite bad at gardening. Um, a few times I've tried uh, over the years and... Uh, for some reason, my plants always die. And uh, I realized that one key factor, as rudimentary as it is, is that I do not water them enough. And so within months, they just wither and die. But we thank God that He is not like me. We thank God that He is this unending stream of water. And the psalmist tells anyone who continues to walk in the way of God as God's people that if you delight in the law of the Lord. If you draw close to his heart every day, you are like a tree that is planted by the streams of water. 
that yields its fruit in its season. Now, as Christians today, it's not lost to us that Jesus uses this kind of imagery, especially in the Gospel of John. And when he talks about prospering, he uses the analogy of fruitfulness, actually. And if you have your Bibles, you could turn it with me as well to John 15. And this is what Jesus has to say about bearing fruit, about prospering in him. In John 15, verse 4, he says, Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. Jesus is that culmination of the streams of living water because it is through him when we are in him, not only looking at him or hearing about his message of, God, of the gospel, but when we commit and respond to it, when we become part of him, it is an inevitability that we will indeed experience a life of prosperity, of fruitfulness. Uh, at, this, at this juncture, it is uh, important for all of us to also be reminded that um, the people of Israel had all the revelation of God in terms of what was expected, in terms of what would be the blueprint for flourishing. And yet we know that because of sin, they were not able to be faithful. But we thank God because we know His plan culminates in Jesus Christ. Because through Him, not only does He take away our sin, not only does He give us this avenue to flourish, but He enables us to do so, to change our hearts of stone into hearts of flesh, to bring forth the Holy Spirit, to cause us to be able to draw near, to want to delight, to have joy in His presence, to walk in the way of the cross. It is through Jesus that every day we see God more clearly, we love Him more dearly, and we follow Him more nearly, day by day. Now the Psalms begins with Psalm 1 because it essentially sets the foundation for worship. I remember sometimes, you know, uh, in my earlier days when I was a worship leader and we tried to get people to clap their hands, to sing along, to raise their hands, and almost to the point of desperation, either because it's too early in the morning or people are just not up for it. But the Psalms gives us that theological foundation for why we are to burst out in joy. Why we worship this God? Why we bless Him? Why we bless Him? Because we realize that in Christ, we are a people who are blessed. Psalm 1 tells us that when we see, when our eyes are open, when the eyes of our hearts of hearts see the beauty of God's plan for all creation and His people and the world, and when we see that culminating in Jesus Christ through the power of the Spirit, we see hope we see that it is possible. Let, let me encourage you at this point in time to, to really pause for a moment, to reflect on this. What is a life of flourishing? Is it just about being resourceful? Is it just about being with like-minded people who commit to positive thinking and mindfulness? I humbly submit before all of us that the refrain of Scripture is this, that we are always to be in Christ that we are always to have His mind and His heart of love for each other, for the world. Exemplified especially in the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross for the whole world. And a life of blessing, a life of blessing is undergirded by a heart that is so close to the heart of God as revealed in His Holy Word. We've talked about how the law of the Lord is to be our delight. We talked about how the effects of that delight in God's law leads to a life of prosperity. But what is the end game? What is the final outcome? What are we looking towards? We, we have talked about many times in church about being a people of hope. What is our hope? In light of the realities around us in the world, sometimes it is difficult to keep our eyes on Jesus because when we look around the world, we say, well, God, you've promised flourishing. And at times we look around there's just so much need, there's so much pain, there's so much sickness. 
But Psalm 1, as we will see, sets the tone for the rest of the Psalms because we know that as Christians, we, are not, we don't need to be happy clappy all the time, isn't it? Psalms shows us that model of how we can just strip off all our layers and just be ourselves with God, celebrate with joy when we receive His blessing, cry out to Him when we look at the evil and injustice around us. We don't have to put on a mask. Why is that possible? The fact that we can continue to do so in hope is because even at the very beginning of the book of Psalms, the assurance is that the day of righteousness will come. As long as we stay the course, committing to loving our God with all our heart, soul, mind and strength, committing to love everyone around, around us as ourselves, as we love them sacrificially in the way of Jesus, in the way of righteousness, the day will come on the day of judgment when God will bring all His promises to a complete realization. That's why it says in our final section, isn't it, in Psalm 1 verse 5, the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. Finally, what does it mean to be righteous? When we talk about righteousness, even in the Old Testament, uh, we're not talking about perfection. Anyone who has read through the stories and narratives in the Old Testament know that many of these so-called heroes of faith, whether they be Abraham, even Gideon in the book of Judges, even King David, they were all flawed. They were cowards. They were even murderers at some point. But what distinguishes them from the rest is that they realized their faults. They realized their weaknesses and they nevertheless cried out to God, said, God, I know your will. I've fallen short. Help me. And righteousness comes through faith. And Jesus becomes our righteousness today. So take heart, my friends, as we reflect on Scripture. God is not calling us as perfect beings, but He's calling us to yield to Him in the way of righteousness and to know that in Christ, the Holy Spirit will transform us daily into the likeness of His Son, Jesus. And as we stay that course, with the overwhelming transformative power of the Holy Spirit, we know that we can stand in the day of judgment. We will experience a life that is planted by streams of water. Let us just take this time to, to pray. Father, for all that has been shared, for all that has been brought forward in terms of questions and to how we respond to your word, we ask for God right now for the Holy Spirit to move us, to guide us into all truth. We thank you, O Lord, that you are here. Speak to us, O God, even in this moment of pause. Speak. And God, we respond to your word right now. We ask, oh God, that you stir in our hearts this hunger for your word, to know that your word is life, to know that your Holy Spirit inspires Holy Scripture to cause us to see the treasure of Jesus, to cause us to see that it is possible to walk in the way of righteousness because of Jesus that as children of God in Him, we can approach your throne of grace with confidence, knowing that God our Father, you love us. And God our Father, you have great plans for your beloved children to not only experience your blessing in our lives, but to share it with the rest of the world. Help us therefore, oh God, to respond with gratefulness, with joyful surrender and with diligence to know your heart through your word so that we may be enabled by your Holy Spirit to go out to set us free, to live and work to your praise and glory. Amen. Let us now continue in a time of worship. 